So good morning to you, all my brothers and sisters and young people. And this morning I'm going to walk through a few aspects of love. The topic of love, of course, is huge. Who to love, when, how, what is love anyway? And why did, God, why did John describe God as love? I won't even pretend to cover it all, but we'll look at one of the drivers of when to love, which is compassion or mercy, and we will move on to talk about a few ways to express our love to each other. So a couple of weeks ago, the Adelaide youth had their recreation camp at Bushhaven. It was a really great weekend. Bushhaven itself served up its usual stuff with at least one utility not working properly. This time it was the water. A nasty stuck valve prevented water flow so the toilet systems didn't fill. Showering was actually dry cleaning, but who showers at Bushhaven anyway? Bucketing water into the toilet block became another wonderful hosting experience on the Saturday morning. But it was all okay. A gentle hit with a hammer released the valve and the water flow was fixed. Unfortunately, the valve needed to be hit a few times that day and one gentle tap with the hammer too many made a new decorative water feature with spray in all directions, the Bushhaven blowhole. Ah, Bushhaven. Many of you would have had the same type of experience over the years. Broken, but beautiful. Uncomfortable, but relaxing. The real thing about Bushhaven is not really the place. It's what happens there. And the youth group had a fantastic camp. The main reason for a rec camp is to be together, play games, have meaningful conversation, establish kingdom friends. The youth also had some excellent studies and meditations as part of their rec camp. The Adelaide Youth theme this year is Love in Action. Many of their classes and activities, including the recent camp, have this in mind. Adelaide Youth are a growing, dynamic and enthusiastic group at the moment and it's a real pleasure to have children in youth group age and to be a host. At their rec camp, they had some of their group lead interactive and practical sessions. They were excellent. Rachel Morrison and Emily Saxon guided the 35 young people at camp into smaller groups where they developed a month plan of thematic Bible readings and discussions for their group. Each member of the group reads the verses for the day and then provides a thought or two to the group using one of the standard social media platforms. A fantastic idea for people who cannot easily see each other every day. A great example of social learning that we, as an ecclesia, could look at. Most of the groups chose something related to love and the practical application of love. Another main study theme at the camp was compassion or mercy. Hannah Saxon led a great interactive session leading off with the observation that pretty much all uses of the words mercy and compassion in the Old Testament were in reference to God. Compassion is a key attribute of God. Then in the New Testament, Jesus takes up this mantle. People petition Jesus to have mercy and heal a huge range of diseases. And it's clear to us that we need to emulate Jesus by being compassionate. Psalm 103, the reading this morning, is a study of compassion. For this psalm, I think we can regard mercy and compassion as the same concept, having a deep sympathy and sorrow for someone who's having a hard time and having a strong desire to help. Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, 
who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Mercy linked with steadfast love is worn by you and me as a crown. Mercy is the characteristic, the virtue, which makes us royalty. God is the king and we are crown princes and crown princesses. No longer are we Mr or Mrs or Ms or whatever. We are at very least barons or earls or lords or princes or princesses. We are part of God's family and God is a king. It is mercy which conquers our iniquities and diseases and picks us up out of life's gutters. Mercy is not just a ruby or a sapphire in the crown. It's not a small tiara that covers a fraction of our head. It is the entire crown we wear is mercy. Everyone can see the crown on the head of a king or prince or princess, and that crown for us is mercy. So now that we're genuine royalty, we need to, as it says in verse 6, work righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed, just as God does. We need to be, in verse 8, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We need to be careful to put compassion first when we are wronged by someone. Look at verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As James puts it in James 2 verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. In everyday terms, that means we must think about compassion before vengeance or retribution. If someone takes money from us, think compassion. If someone's using you as a stepping stone on their career path, think compassion. If someone shoves you around physically, mentally or spiritually, think compassion. The absolute best example of this is found in Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 23, Dear princes and princesses, the king wants to settle his accounts. We know the story well. One servant owed this king a huge amount of money, an almost impossible to believe amount of money, millions of dollars. And when the king was to sell him and his family in order to pay off the debt, the servant collapsed and groveled at the king's feet in verse 27. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Out of pity. The king was compassionate and showed mercy. Wouldn't it be great if that was the end of the story? But we all know it's not. The man seemed to learn nothing he thought that he was now free to do whatever he wanted. Instead of being humbled by the compassion shown to him, he thought he was scot-free and somehow invincible. Upon finding a colleague who owed him a few bucks, he did not show the same compassion and threw that other servant into the debtor's prison. Of course, the king found out and threw the unforgiving servant into the same prison. The closing message of the parable in verse 35 is the need to forgive your brothers and sisters. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And the strong message or the theme that ties the story together is that forgiveness starts from pity and happens because of mercy. 
We need to have a compassionate heart. We need to have compassion as our crown. Sometimes we may confuse compassion with weakness. Do you think the king was weak to forgive such an enormous debt for this servant? If someone steals from you or hits you or somehow wrongs you and you show compassion and forgive that person, is that weakness? What about justice? Surely someone who steals from you should be captured and punished and forced to make restitution in some way. Every society has laws against stealing. The law of Moses was very specific about it. One of the Ten Commandments covered theft. Surely it's just and right to hand out punishment for transgressions. How can we be compassionate and show mercy but still uphold justice? Well, back in Psalm 103, in verse 6, we find the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. And in verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Our king is both merciful and just. It can be done. There are consequences to actions for breaking the law. To have a just society and lead a just life, consequences for wrongdoing must happen. David learnt this only too well when he conducted his illegal census and found that punishment must happen. But the punishment was lessened by the mercy of God. Finding someone who commits a crime is justice. Showing wisdom in sentencing is compassion. Have a quick look at Isaiah chapter 30. Verse 18. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Mercy and justice are intimately linked. You cannot have one without the other. And if there's any doubt about the balance between mercy and justice, the harder road must be followed. Remember James chapter 2, verse 13? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We wear a crown of compassion or mercy as part of love. Compassion is one of the guides for when we are to express love. I'd now like to look at a few ways to put this compassion in action. Many of us would know of a popular psychology book written by Gary Chapman on the five love languages. Chapman believes that the way we like to receive love and the way we express our love are the same. And that out of the five broad types, we prefer one or two of them. We understand all five, we just prefer one or two of them. While not dire uh, directly a scriptural concept, it does actually strongly align with what we see and experience around us. And it aligns very well with how love appears in action in the Bible. At the youth group rec camp, Beck and Bayrat Gilfillan led the group in self-discovery of their own love languages. The five love languages are all ab about actions associated with love. They are receiving gifts, quality time, words of affirmation, acts of service, 
and physical touch. Let's have a bit of a look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And as he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. This rich young man was a rules-based thinker. Many of us love rules. God knows this, which is why so much of the Bible is devoted to rules. Like in the Old Testament, the people of Israel had rules to follow. And even throughout Jesus' teachings and the letters of Paul and Peter, there are rules. Many people love rules. If you follow the rules, there's no ambiguity. You're doing the right thing. This young man loved the rules of God and the rules of his community. But he knew deep down there was something missing. So he asked Jesus what he needed to do. He could have asked Jesus, what do I need to think? Or what attitude must I have? Or what must I feel? Or what must I say? Or any number of other questions he could have asked. But he wanted to know what he had to do. And Jesus, astute as ever, picked up this, how this man ticked straight away. He was wealthy. He was feeling blessed because of his wealth. He was probably generous with the ones he loved. He was probably happy to receive gifts as well. He tried to follow rules, but he was feeling that there was a missing piece and he didn't even know how to describe what was missing. Jesus could have said, have compassion on the poor or develop mercy and caring for those less fortunate than you. Jesus could have answered with concepts about changing his life view, changing his attitude, or building virtues. But the man needed something a bit more concrete. He needed something to do. Whether this rich young man's dominant love language um, was about giving and receiving gifts, I cannot say. But Jesus picked up that it probably was and he spoke with him about giving gifts and it resonated so strongly with the man not just give a gift but make a gift out of everything he owns for people who don't really have a strong preference for gift giving as our love language we read this story and understand it at a, on an academic level okay put people before possessions Rules can be useful to guide our actions. Trust in the ability of God to look after us both now and in the future. We can understand the parable. But to someone whose dominant love language is giving and receiving of gifts, this is an emotionally powerful tearjerker of a story. How much do I need to love the poor? With every part of me? To a gift giver, it's not so much the cost of the gift that matters, 
It's all about the love shown in giving or receiving the gift. And Jesus was telling this man to love powerfully. He went away sad because he knew how much that love would cost him. For a gift giver, this was the ultimate challenge. Give everything. Love with everything you have. But as we know, he shouldn't have really worried. No matter how much he thought he had to give, God can and will give more. Luke chapter 6, Jesus describes it in verse 38. Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, will be the, it will be measured back to you. Blessed are those who give, for they shall receive in abundance. Jesus was constantly using words of affirmation. He understood the power of a story and gave his messages in parables. He understood how to give strengthening and comforting messages. He understood the power of words for people who love hearing words of affirmation. For many people, words are love. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 contains some of the most powerful messages of love of all of Jesus' words. The Beatitudes in Matthew 5 are a key part of his love sermon. It's not a checklist of tasks or even a comprehensive list of personal values or attributes. The love sermon is meant to provide words of affirmation when you are doing well and when you're not. Love, life affirming words of encouragement. Take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 11. And I'd like you to read along in your own Bible while I paraphrase it. Jesus says, and I'm paraphrasing a lot, here are my words of affirming love for you. I will always love you. Love is poor in, the, in spirit at times, but working together, love will lead you directly into the kingdom of heaven. My love for you is comforting. All love is humble. I love you for your meekness. You may have a visceral yearning for something better in life, and I promise you that love is a thing to fill you up. Love is compassionate, always, and you are compassionate. There is nothing more pure and peaceful than love, and you are part of my family because of your love. I know coming up with the right words of encouragement and love at times is hard. Sometimes people will hate you because you show compassion speaking affirming words and declare your love for me. Do not fear. You are courageous, strong, gifted and welcome in the family of God. As you read through the Gospels next time or in your private Bible study, look for words of affirmation. These are words of love. We could look at any number of parts of the gospel and easily find Jesus speaking words of love and encouragement and challenge and wisdom and hope. All life affirming, all words of affirmation. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall hear God. I find that it's sometimes hard to get a sense of time in the gospels Everything, as we know, is actually a summary of what happened. 
we don't actually see how much time spent uh, Jesus spent with his close friends. But we do get a sense that his ministry was extremely busy. And we know there are times when Jesus just craved solitude and quiet prayer and meditation. So while we're in Matthew, turn over to chapter 14. Verse 22. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, and for the wind was against them. So Jesus was by himself probably for a couple of hours, maybe a few hours. It was time alone with his father. Time to remember John the Baptist. Time to understand the importance of what John's death means to Jesus, his ministry and his own impending death. Quality time with his father. Jesus not only sought quality time for himself, and it was wonderful when his friends and disciples gave him that time, but he also gave it to other people. We know well the story of the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus, feeling thirsty and weary from his journey through Samaria, waited at Jacob's well while his disciples went into the town to buy food. And while he waited, a local woman, a woman of questionable morals, but pretty good spiritual knowledge, came up to draw water. And Jesus wanted to engage with this woman in order to spread the good news. He could have performed an act of service and offered to draw the water out for her. But he did not. He could have given her words of affirmation, but he did not. The conversation recorded for us is transformative for the woman, but they weren't words of affirmation. Never did he say, good job or well done. He could have given her a gift, and you could argue that he did. He did not touch her. Out of the five love languages, Jesus chose to give this woman time. Once again, Jesus knew the best way to someone's heart. For a Jew to speak to a Samaritan was unheard of. Jesus not only spoke with her, but he stayed in that town for two more days. Quality time. Blessed are those who are generous with their time, for they shall see eternity. And the most well-known example of Jesus seeking quality time just before his capture and trial was in the garden on the Mount of Olives when Jesus finds time to pray alone. Let's have a look at the record in Luke. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you not enter into temptation. But he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus needed, and God gave him, quality time. With a bonus, Luke tells us there was an angel present to strengthen him. 
Verse 43, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Jesus was in agony, about to be humiliated and killed. What do you think this angel was doing? How did the angel strengthen Jesus? Was he standing to attention, sword in hand, chanting, chanting courageous and strengthening slogans? Like a sergeant yelling at his troops to be strong. Is that what you think Jesus needed at this time of grief? I think the angel was kneeling next to our Lord, arm across the sunken shoulder of Jesus, whispering words of love, reminding Jesus of the ultimate vision and counselling Jesus about dealing with pain and humiliation, providing that energy that can be transmitted through touch providing security, embracing Jesus with love. For those who fully appreciate the power of physical touch as a language of love, you will be moved profoundly by this event, the incredible power of a hug, the genuine feeling of transmitted energy, more powerful than electricity, through a loving hand, or the gentle wiping of a tear. Jesus needed the love language of physical touch. It's what got him through his most darkest hour. He almost always touched someone when he healed them. He felt power leave him when somebody touched him God touched him with a dove after his baptism. Jesus responded to physical touch. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We remember Jesus now in this bread and the wine. A man who always wore his crown of compassion, that compassionate act of service, and understood the importance of the different approaches in displaying love to everyone. And I'd like to finish now with some profound words from 1st of John. 1st of John, chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God is love.